welcome Mark Frauenfelder, David Peskovitz, Jenny Jardin, and Corey Doctorow. Well, hello everybody. Uh, we're doing this late in the afternoon because there's a persistent rumor that the editorial staff of Boing Boing are vampires, and I think we've disproven that today. It's the best time of day to do an event here because we're all alert and ready to go. Uh, so Boing Boing, many people don't know, was founded as a zine in 1988 by Mark and his wife, Carla Sinclair. That was a kind of publication. Yeah, so the kind of publication, if you don't know, was, uh, as I advance here, all right, there we go. The kind of publication that was photocopied, it was stapled, it was bound, it was distributed through record stores and head shops and specialty publication stores. It was one of maybe thousands or tens of thousands of publications that came out of that time. Most or all of them are gone. Boing Boing's persisted into the digital age. It's still thriving. It's a directory of wonderful things, and we have four wonderful people who helped shepherd it from the beginning to the current day here with us on stage. There's a brief history here of Boing Boing logos in the back of Mark. I don't know if you can remember all of these. It's gone through a lot of changes over the years, but it actually continues to uh, exemplify some of the modern ideas of uh, back in its early days of web journalism. Trying to advance the next slide, I'm sorry. Can we go to the next? It's going too slow. Technology, of course, has not advanced as fast as I'd like the slides to advance, but that's my doing. And one more, we'll get to the present and then come along. I'm so sorry. There we go, and then, there we go. So, the, the zine had a paywall, of course. You needed a paywall, but the e-commerce options were really cumbersome in those days. <laughs> You had to you know, fill out paper and send it in. There was an advertising model, very affordable, but they only sold the most rigorously tested scientific products <laughs> available. They sold t-shirts, of course. T-shirts is the basis of the internet economy, even in the zine days, that was a, a valuable tool. They were focused then, even then, on the problems and value of Cryptography, and of course, in a couple of years, it would all be solved. In 1988, cryptography would prevent Big Brother. When that's turned out to be true, they can't detect us at all. <laughs> Apparently, early readers thought that uh, maybe they spent a little too much time on this futurist and computer stuff. That, sadly, hasn't changed either, has it? <laughs> it's been often called the modern descendant of Omni magazine. There are always haters. You can never get away from them. But it's fully entered and embraced the modern culture. I, I don't know, I think that Bang Bang might have been a better name, just a little more snappy than Boing Boing, but. When, when the California uh, was legalizing marijuana, we thought of starting Bong Bong. Bong Bong. <laughs> and here's some of the transition over the years. So that's just the brief zine introduction. But Mark, you started this publication in 1988. What were you and Carla looking for that you couldn't get, that you needed to make, that you couldn't find on a newsstand or in, in, in zine culture? Yeah, um, I just felt that at the time, computers, the price of computers were getting low enough that they were getting into the hands of creative people, artists and uh, people who normally wouldn't be able to get their hands on technology. And once they were getting it, they were doing cool things. And so um, people were doing great things with comic book art and uh, desktop publishing, all those kinds of things. And so I wanted a zine that covered just my personal interests. Um, cyberpunk science fiction at the time was really interesting to me. Independent and underground comics, uh, brain machines, uh, all those kinds of things that were happening, things that, that geeks were interested in besides the computers themselves. And so there wasn't really a magazine like that. And I thought it would be fun to create a magazine that I would like to read. So my wife and I started thinking about it and slowly put the issue together, interviewed people like Robert Anton Wilson. There was a, like a libertarian candidate for state senate in California. We interviewed him um, and just slowly started putting this together. And as it went along, I like first was basically like doing a lot of hand lettering. And then I 
bought desktop publishing software and said, oh, I can you know, typeset it and just evolved that way. There was a real culture of zines that I think maybe we're seeing again on the internet now, but you were part of a, a giant movement. It wasn't just a Boing Boing and a couple other people. It was this vast culture of zines and zine stores and sold everywhere. Did you, I mean, did you get yourself immersed in that culture and then have to become part of it? Did you go and meet with other people? It was a very a solitary venture. Um, there was a, a, an issue of Whole Earth Review that came out in 1987. Kevin Kelly was editing the Whole Earth Review and it was called The Signal Issue and it was actually the prototype for Wired magazine six years before Wired. Kevin was one of the founders of Wired. And in there, was, there was an article about zines and I read this and one of the zines they mentioned was a zine of zines called Fact Sheet 5, this guy who lived in upstate New York. Oh good, I'm glad you guys can hear. But, so people would send Mike these, their zines and every three months he would publish this like 80 page newsprint zine that had like little capsule reviews. And I went through that with a yellow highlighter. I was like, this is great. And I was just ordering like zines like The Optimistic Pessimist for, was for Pez collectors and I just love the title. So <laughs> all these great, and so then um, I, I just naturally, it was so interesting to me, I, I had to do it. And so by publishing a zine, I just, instead of buying them, I traded subscriptions with people. And uh, I ended up, a lot of the people that I traded zines with, like Gareth Branwin, ended up becoming lifelong friends just because we swapped zine subscriptions. It's fascinating looking at the bylines from the early zine issues, and I'm like, I know that person, and that person, and that person, there's a through line. Many of these people have become, you know, uh, better known in different fields, in, in journalism, futurism, science fiction. But uh, David, you came along a few years into this venture. You met Mark, how did you meet Mark and Carla? So, uh, this was in the very early 90s. I, I was from Cincinnati, Ohio, and immersed in sort of the uh, the punk scene, but what it's interested me about punk was not actually the music so much, but more the DIY ethic. And so I had played around with some zine stuff. I was into computers and BBSs um, at the time since, you know, the, the early 80s or so. And I had come out to uh, San Francisco um, as a journalist writing for weeklies to interview uh, Are You Serious and Tim Leary. Um, and, and who both had a huge influence on my life and um, Vale from Research Books. And I remember Are You and Tim telling me about this thing happening in San Francisco at the intersection of um, music and computers and psychedelic drugs. And I was sold. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, and obviously there's a whole history in, in, in Silicon Valley around that, that sort of vibe. And so I came out and started working um, as an intern at Wired very early on. And I had read Boing Boing, which I had learned about through Fact Sheet 5 or the book High Weirdness by Mail, I think, which was a subgenius book. And I met Mark immediately and you know, was really excited to meet him because we shared so many interests. And I knew that from reading Boing Boing. He brought me downstairs to the Wired office where Carla had a desk set up um, and was working on the print zine. And we had a great conversation and she gave me a bottle of vasopressin, that smart drug. And I you know, took my vasopressin like a good boy. And, um, we had some great talks and then I just started talking about things that I wanted to write that no way in hell Wired even was going to publish or nobody else was going to publish. And Mark was like, oh great, we'll put that on Boing Boing. And then, you know, I started writing for, for Boing Boing. I can't remember which issue that was, but for at least like the last five or so and became a contributing editor. Is it hard to remember now the days in which there were such strong gatekeepers? You talk about that and I actually sort of have a hard time remembering when you couldn't just get something published. Well, that, that was one of the main reasons, I think, that, that um, you know, I was excited about zines was because at the time, I mean, finally people were interested in publishing articles about computers and Wired even had some fringe stuff and there was Mondo 2000, so there were sort of slightly paying outlets starting to bubble up that were covering the, the weird things that I was interested in. Um, so I was thrilled to have a place that would, that would allow me to, to you know, write about, I remember one of my first pieces for Boing Boing the print zine was an interview with a woman who, her job was to be the person who would listen and it would be basically the intermediary when a deaf person wanted to make a telephone call to a hearing person. Um, and so she would do the typing and the listening and then the speaking back and forth and she told these amazing stories about, you know, two and a half hour epic phone sex calls where she was the person speaking. <laughs> 
Um, or fights between couples, and they would say, operator, what do you think about that? Who's right here? And just, I mean, who's gonna, and drug deal <laughs> deals, and she told me there was one time she was sitting next to a priest who, who also was one of these uh, volunteer uh, operators, and he had to do a sex call, and you know, it was just this amazing story, and I, and I could, who, who's gonna publish something like that? And I told him, Mark and Carla, and they were like, oh, write it up, and it was like, <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and you were there during the transition. We've already I've got some screen captures of, issue, of uh, front pages as we go over time. You were there at the transition when all of a sudden, 1995, this idea of the web, this thing that people could reach came in. You guys, how did you come to the point where, where be, I'm sorry, we're beyond there already, but where you said um, there's something here that we can bring the zine philosophy to this new medium. I can't, I can't, there's no going back. There was, I, I remember it became the point, at a certain point, you had told me that you were, um, you were tired of chasing distributors down for the $12 they owed you for the print zine, and, and it just became such a hassle, and so we just started writing stuff for the, to the web. I remember writing a feature, again, that who's gonna publish this? It was about self-trepanation, people who were drilling holes in their head to achieve higher consciousness, and I was like obsessed with this idea, like what the, well, how would you possibly drill a hole in your own head with a, with a drill from Home Depot? And, and so interviewing those people, and so it's like that became something where like, okay, I wrote this article and it ends up on the, on the website. You can still read those articles on the website. The and so there was a point when the zine economics started to fail, and you guys said, yeah. this is time to go web only, we've got we yeah. to switch to the web. Um, uh, one of the final issues, we, our circulation was like, I think 17,500 was our print run, which was big for, for a zine. And uh, a couple of distributors folded at the same time, owing us like tens of thousands of dollars. And it kind of, they owed a lot of zine, like large zines money too, and it just what flattened the zine industry. Oh, zine that world. Happened? And, it, it, yeah. Sort of, there was a point people remember, I didn't realize yeah. it was the distributors, they took everybody down yeah. with them, yeah. but the web existed. Right, and so then it was just like a natural to, put it online. And uh, a friend of mine, when we were working at Wired, back in the days when you could register domain names for free, you didn't even have to pay, you registered boingboing.com. We lost that. years later, Mark forgot to re-register it, so that's why we're boingboing.net. Although we finally got boingboing.com back, like last year. So here's the problem. When you start a website, everyone in the audience, well aware of this, this is now a known phenomenon, uh, it becomes an angry maw that must be fed. Corey, this angry maw stares you in the face, but you were this punk guy from Toronto, an apartment full of Disney stuff. You were a crap hound, you were a programmer, you, had, you were working on open source projects. How did you get mixed up with these guys? So I, well, so I worked in uh, bookstores, science fiction bookstores, and so the interesting thing about this distributor that tanked and took all the zines down with them is they, the, they were also the ones who brought the zines everywhere. You may remember that there is a point sort of around 1991, where if you went into like the basement of a Tower Records, they would just have a rack of zines in it, that were like the kind of, you know, the, the proto-web that had somehow materialized all over the world, and it was because these, these distributors had taken them all around. So working in science fiction bookstores in Toronto, I was selling Boing Boing in the late 80s and reading it avidly and very excited about it, and I met Mark when I moved to San Francisco uh, to open the San Francisco office of a software company I helped found in Toronto, OpenCola, and uh, Mark profiled me for the industry standard and then went on to pitch a profile of Ev and something about blogger to the industry standard, which Battelle spiked because blogging was just a fad. Um, <laughs> but he'd started Boing Boing to kind of, uh, to, to, as a, like a, a to, to research for the article. He'd started the Boing Boing.net blog running on blogger software as research for the article, and he'd, he'd posted a few things every few days and had, had you know, friends in this sort of community of old Boing Boing readers who were reading it, but then he kind of hit the jackpot when he um, discovered what the Segway was. You remember that Dean came in and invented a thing and no one knew what it was, but it was gonna Mark, change yeah, the world. Mark looked up the patent, uh, uh, looked up Dean Kamen's name, and then there was a picture of the Segway, and he just posted it with, is this, the, is this Ginger? So it, it ended up on CNN that night and had like our traffic went from like 40 to 6,000. And Mark sent me an email saying, you know, I'm going on holiday tomorrow uh, for two weeks. If some of those people come back, it would be nice if there was something new for them to read. Do you want to edit it for a couple of weeks? So I edited Boing Boing for a couple of weeks. And when, when he came back, he said, well, that, that was very good. Would you like to go on editing it? And I just sort of, uh, 
I, I've always been one of those people who sort of runs around with a bag full of interesting things, shoving them in people's face, going, look, look, have you seen this yet? And so I, I, it was a natural place for me to be. And the great thing, Corey, when I was doing Boeing, when I was like doing maybe one post a day, three posts a week, and then when, when I left for vacation, you were doing like 20 posts a day. And it was like, oh my and God. And the traffic, the traffic shot up like a rocket when that happened. There's a, there's a term for it, I'm a fellow sufferer, it's called bloggeria. And mm -hmm. we've, we're both, you know, there's no cure except publication. It's like, you know, leeching a wound. So you have to keep writing. Paul DeFilippo once wrote a short story for magazine of fantasy and science fiction, which is this post-apocalyptic story in which all of civilization has collapsed. And the narrator runs into me in San Francisco and I'm holding a satchel full of clippings that I take out and start showing to them compulsively. Uh, which I think is probably not that far off from what would actually happen if the world came to Entirely an end. Entirely accurate. Yeah. So this, this gets underway and you've got, uh, you're feeding this maw. The maw is being fed, you're getting more and more traffic. I remember there was a point you started to bring in guest bloggers. You'd have people be a guest editor for a bit. And Shenny, you came in as a, as a guest editor what were your interests, again, it's always this interesting Motley crew and these writers, futurism. What attracted you to, to come on board at the guest editor role in that first, that first time? Uh, you were the only person, I think, that we knew each other, but yeah. you didn't know them yet. Yeah. Uh, I had been writing and uh, producing events for different technology publications. I was freelancing for Wired and uh, doing stuff with Jason Calacanis with Silicon Alley Reporter back in the day. And uh, I met Mark at a dinner party in, uh, in Los Angeles and walked up to him and said, my God, I, I, I can't believe it's Mark Frauenfelder. I'm such a big fan of Boing Boing. I love your website. I love your zine. And he said, oh, that's nice. Uh, would you like to guest blog for us sometime? He sounded like a very enthusiastic person. <laughs> and <laughs> and I, he set me up and I started guest blogging and I forget how long it was into it, but um, I think like Howard Rheingold emailed you guys and said, she's not bad, you should consider keeping her. And this was all a labor of love. Like there was, the, the idea that we would ever get paid for doing this was preposterous at the time. And I remember Corey emailed me and said, hey, we've been thinking about it and you know, you seem like a good fit. Would you like to be part of the gang? And I was like, would I? <laughs> It's like there's some combination. It's somewhere between like the origin story of superheroes and like the formation of a band. You're like, we need a bass player. Wait, she's great. Let's get her on board. The drummer hasn't yet blown up, so we're good. It was, it was shortly after that, I think, that it became, I don't know where you're going, but, but you know, where we need. <laughs> a lot of notes. I, I remember paying where we all, yep. Corey would come to all of us and say, okay, guys, it's time to, time you to know, chip in. time to chip in um, for the band with Bill. That's where I was going. David, tell me about this. There was a point where, but well, that was the thing, right? We're, you know, it's again from the era of 2013, and you can buy terabytes of transit for pennies in those days. But it cost money. You had servers running, you had people to help you, system admins. It was this crazy big thing because you were getting serious more and more and more traffic. 2004, 2003. So a thousand dollars a month, and we could see there was going to creep up to two thousand a month very soon, and we were all chipping in out of our own pocket. And like 200 bucks a month for a freelance technology writer in 2003 is a lot of money. Yeah. It's a lot of money now. So Ken Snyder, who's still our, our systems administrator and is now the head of technology for Wikimedia, uh, had worked for me at OpenCola, and he um, uh, was hosting us for free. And then the bandwidth bills got to the point where he was like, could you give me 50 bucks a month? And then one month he called up and he said, you know, it's actually gone way up. It's going to be $1,000 this month. And that was kind of our come to Jesus moment where we, we figured that we actually had to make some money because none of us could afford to pay $1,000 to have a hobby. So you, you hired a band manager. You needed a Reuben for your Partridge family. Yeah, Reuben. Uh, so Mark and I knew John Battelle because he was essentially our boss at Wired. Um, and he went to journalism school a couple years, uh, the same journalism school I went to, and also Jason Snell is in the audience. And um, so we knew John and called him and said, well, you know, do you think we can you know, get enough money to cover our bandwidth bill here and, and do this? And so we gave, he's like, well, give me a list of people who you'd want advertising on the site. And we did. And I remember we got a couple banners. This is you know a decade after Hotwired had done the first banner advertising on the right on, on the rise. But did you have conflicted feelings among any of the four of you? I know you were more in the in the sort of towards the publisher role. This had been your baby, and you brought other people in. When you thought, okay, we're going to put advertising on, did you need a, an approach that would let you 
fit advertising into the boing boing ethos and, and ethics. So, so what's the question? It's what, how did advertising affect your- Did you ever feel your, guilty oh. about feel, getting an ad? That's right, like, oh, yeah. guilty lucre is my question. But no, did you, did you have an issue with take, you know, bringing in ads? Yeah. Do you have a problem with it? No, I didn't. I mean, when I was doing Boing Boing as a zine, I, I wanted it to be partially ad supported. And it's a way to, to con it was a way to continue to publish Boing Boing, a way that we didn't have to take money out of our own pocket to keep it going and in fact, be able to pay more attention and continue to publish it and offer it for free to people. So. I didn't have a problem with it at all. I was actually really excited about it. And what was Mike Gunderloy from Fact Sheet 5's advice on ads? Oh yeah, he said I will accept any legal ad, which got him in a lot of <laughs> We didn't go water. quite that yeah, far, yeah. but well, do I remember we took right? an ad from O'Reilly. Uh, John Battelle. <laughs> O'Reilly Books, not O'Reilly. Uh, uh. John Battelle went on to found Federated Media, Media, which has become one of the biggest, uh, you know, it's a giant ad agency representation thing. And one of the things that was unique about them, and I think this came out of Boing Boing, was that, because uh, I was an early federated media customer at my Wi-Fi site or average publisher, uh, you could reject ads. Yes. Mm -hmm. He'd bring, you could have, ads weren't auto-approved on the Still site. Can. Yeah, and yeah. It's, I mean, is that, was that a, a, a point for you or did, was that something John suggested? I've always wondered where that came John, from. I mean, John, the, John, I think, Boing Boing was the experiment that, that sort of proved and led the way to, to federated media. And after Boing Boing, I think it was uh, Metafilter, I think, and, Matt says, says nods, yeah, kind of, and, and others. Um, and so, I mean, that, you know, that John did come from the world of, of journalism, of real journalism, and, and you know, uh, uh, had moved over into the sort of the business side of publishing from there. So he understood, I think, that the importance of, uh, the, 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 and to this day, the, the reason people like us, I think, and come to the site is because, you know, we do have, you know, ethics around that. And we, and we've rejected a lot of ads. A lot. I mean, that's uh, the stories you never hear, are the ads that we've rejected. And, and we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what to do when we're divided about, about which ads to take and which not to take. And, and a few years ago, arrived at the idea that it would operate on consensus after experimenting unsuccessfully with voting. We decided that, that basically um, any one of us could block consensus on an ad. Uh, and you know, that kind of model comes with an enormous amount of trust because you're trusting the other people never to use that in uh, lightly, you know, never to say, well, I, I believe I should overrule all the rest of you because I disagree unless you really, really disagree. And it's worked well, I think. We're, we're the closest thing to an anarchist collective that I've ever worked for. Only with fewer meetings. Mm. <laughs> well, only, no, like one, we meet basically once a year. One meeting a year, whether we need it or not. <laughs> this, I, I grew up in Eugene, Oregon. I know you're a red diaper baby, Corey. Mm -hmm. so you know what I mean when I say Eugene. And it's, it's uh, I saw co-ops and collectives and communes and so forth coming. I was never part of them. I saw them come and go. What is the secret of this? You say trust, but the editorial process, I think, defies most people at Boing Boing. They think there is an editorial meeting. There's an editorial tone of voice. You guys all have your own thing. How do you make this work? I think it comes from, I mean, we don't, I think it comes from not having meetings. I mean, I think there are certain, there, there are benefits. If we would have had an office, which we've never had, if we would have lived, all lived in the same city, which we've never done, um, I think the site probably would have grown more, probably would have, frankly, made us a lot more money um, and had much greater reach, but I think, in exchange for that, um, the fact that we all do other things outside of Boing Boing still um, enables us to almost treat Boing Boing, and, and there's other people too who are contributing to Boing Boing regularly who are incredibly important to the site now. And I think by all of us sort of treating it as our own independent site in a way and not discussing too much with each other what we're gonna post about, um, it allows us to maintain these different unique voices. And we don't all agree, you know, sometimes people get confused. They say, I can't believe Boing Boing is posting about Bigfoot because they're so pro-science and Bigfoot is pseudoscience or whatever. And it's like, no, it's like, yeah. <laughs> See? <laughs> See? We're in Oregon, so I know I've got some people who are into it out here. But, but uh, you know, we don't agree with each other on everything, and that's okay. Yeah, that's I mean, fine. I think that being loosely coupled has been an enormous advantage in that it, it allows us to, to um, with very, very little overhead, either in terms of money or in terms of the amount of time that we spend discussing what we're gonna do as a fraction of the total time that we spend doing stuff, 
um, we're able to get a lot done. But the things that we're able to get done are uh, limited in scope. The things you can do with a low coordination threshold uh, have really expanded, right? Like the amount of stuff that you could do without ever having phone calls or meetings or having to discuss things in detail. I mean, we hardly even email each other as a group about what's going on and who's going to post what or what, you know, when a post has been made. It's, we, we, are, we have very, very little moment-to-moment -moment coordination or chat or, or anything about that, and it lets us post a hell of a lot of things that I think are pretty interesting and good uh, and in a way that's, that's kind of profitable and, and, and useful to the wider world. But it also means that like, we struggle to you know, get things that aren't that done. Um, but that on the- That said, we're, I, mean, we, I think that that's changed as you know, some of us connect more. Um, you know, Jason Weisberger, who has become involved recently in the last couple of years, um, as a publisher and handling a lot of business stuff. Rob Biskitsu was here last year, is incredibly talented, mm -hmm. um, managing editor, and we have other voices on the site, you know, and we've done a lot of, we've, we've grown, I think, a lot in different ways. You know, we can talk about it later, but we just did a really, I thought, fantastic conference, um, you know, a month ago that did take a lot of coordination, but it's not the kind of coordination that requires all four of us or the extended group of all six or seven of us to engage together all the time or have a lot of meetings. I mean, we'd been doing Boing Boing for six years before we were all in the same room together. Yes. Uh, you know, it's, it's not just that this is the first time we've all been on stage. We've probably I mean, only been all together probably a dozen times. Yeah. At the most. Uh, at the and most. And I think it's important to point out, too, that for a long time, none of us imagined, I think, that it could ever be a, a living. Yeah. And, 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 and I think that's part of why it is what it is, is because it began as a hobby, as a thing that you did for fun, a thing where you shared things that, um, you know, the other publications that you contributed to weren't interested in. It was where your true self could live. And only far, much, much later did it become a business. Yeah, and, and I think over the years we really just shaped the business around our personality types, yeah. too. And, and during the various bubbles that we've weathered, we've had lots of weird, you know, private equity people and venture capitalists and so on send us emails saying like, what would you do if I offered you several million dollars? <laughs> and and our, our question is always, what would you expect us to do to make your several million dollars into several more million dollars? And it always comes down to, you know, uh, effectively selling the company to some giant media company and then being employees for them for three years and then watching it get turned into something that none of us would ever want to read again. And so none of that money ever uh, ended up being money that we took. I remember one time doing a call with one, a major media company, and I, I would say who it was, but I can't remember. It's one of those <laughs> huge ones. And a call with them, and, and the person said, well, you know, we, we can offer you, you know, this kind of money, millions of dollars. And I said, well, what would we, I, I said, what would we do with that, you think? And they said, you know, you could start other blogs. And I was like, <laughs> starting a blog is free. Like, <laughs> was, wasn't that the watchtower? <laughs> <laughs> so as, as the site uh, developed and matured, it became something that you devoted more time into yeah. and developed more revenue so that this was maybe a bigger part that gave you the freedom to do other things. I know it diversified too, and, and Shetty, Boing Boing uh, TV, that was a, a huge and engrossing part of your life for years. I know it's still going on. How do you leap from the sort of the 2D media uh, medium from you know this kind of static thing into this full-blown production? Uh, we started Boing Boing TV, I think it was in 2008, and it was around the time when all of a sudden uh, there was a lot of money available for web video and a lot of advertising uh, excitement around web video, and there was just this sense that, like I remember people telling us, you guys have a really successful blog you've got to do a web show. <laughs> like Andrew Barron used to say that he created Rocket Boom because it was what he imagined Boing Boing would be in video. Do you remember that? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's, I remember him saying that. Um, yeah, we, the, the idea was that we were going to have a, a daily web show that would capture the, the zeitgeist and the, the, the spirit of Boing Boing in video form. And Mark and I co-hosted that, and we, we went through some adventures and a, a lot of stress, and our hair went gray. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah and, and eventually the uh, irrationally available money for web video kind of dried up, and, and the, the crash happened, and um, 
we, it's no longer Boing Boing TV, it's Boing Boing video, and it's just something we do as part of the natural process of, of sharing things that we dig and, and capturing interesting stories. We, we do the video, we do podcasts, we still do the blog. And so, we, yeah, we pick the media. Instead of being yeah. in a situation where, you know, there's advertising dollars that are forcing you essentially to um, do something at a very rapid, accelerated, unnatural pace. Um, in which order is what to the video started for as. Yeah. Expensive production, which is what it was at the time to do right. it, although it's not that case anymore. Now we can say, um, and we're doing this as we create more original content, you say, this would be best for video, or this would make for a great podcast, or this yeah. would make for a great blog post or photos. And so you can pick the media that's appropriate and, and you know, not have this insane, you know. Yeah. We're producing like five, five shows a week, and uh, yeah, it was intense. And, and around the same time, I remember we were getting emails from an ad agency that represented uh, this airline that was about to be launched called Virgin America. And they asked if we would be interested in blogging about some conflict that they were having with the FAA about launching in the US. And uh, one thing led to another, and, and we said, you know, we're producing this video, maybe you'd like to carry it on your in-flight entertainment system. And they, we've maintained that relationship for all of these years. And uh, what we produce now is like, between one and a half and three hours of videos that we've either created ourselves or gathered from, from friends and artists we like, and we kind of string them together into a linear experience with uh, one or more of the Boingers hosting that and talking about why we pick stuff. And we got to name one of their planes. Oh, that's right. We the had, Unicorn Chaser. The Unicorn Chaser. I, yeah. I had lobbied very hard for either technical version or not safe for work. And I they said, that. we can't have a plane with the words not safe in its name. <laughs> yeah. I still, as somebody, who was, as somebody who was heavily influenced in the, in the 70s by shows like That's Incredible, yeah. I still think there's an opportunity for sort of a, 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 a boing boing. Definitely. I, I, and we were all fans, I think, of the, um, the USA Network's show Night Flight. Yeah, Night Anybody Flight was huge to remember for all Night of Flight? us. So we've all, I, I feel like our video efforts have always been, or the Virgin America channel as it exists now, you can watch it on Channel 10 on Virgin. Uh, it, it's kind of like Night Flight. So the thing for me that, that's, that makes writing for Boing Boing incredibly satisfying is that as opposed to the traditional model where you have some demographic in mind and you try to write something that will please this notional demographic in order to attract an advertiser. When I write for Boing Boing, I write the kind of thing that I'm interested in, in the depth that I would want to read about it in, in the hopes that other people who want to read about the same things as me in the depth and at the level of, of technical uh, um, uh, sort of obscurity as me will come along and find it. And that seems to have, have worked really well. And, it's, and there's something very, very rewarding about instead of trying to go off and like pander to someone, you know, this notional consumer. I love, I love uh, uh, William Gibson's description of uh, some, uh, something the size of a baby hippo living in a double wide outside of Topeka with, uh, with, with uh, uh, no hands and no eyelids whose uh, sweat runs down and gets into its eyes constantly, and it has no genitals and can only express its mute extremes of rage and, and, um, uh, and, and joy by changing the channels on a universal remote. So like, you're not trying to please that kind of, you know, that, that kind of notional consumer, and instead you're like, here's some stuff I like. If you like the same stuff as me, maybe the magic of the network will direct you to it, and you can come and share it too. And, and we've never, we never have to construct our stuff, our content, our, our ideas, our work. We never have to construct that around a quota of clicks, a quota of traffic, and we aren't rewarded based on how many people click on something that we produce or how many, how many eyeballs watch it. I, I think that that dynamic would have been really toxic for us, and it would have inherently changed what we do from a, a really sincere expression of joy and curiosity. I, th I think the only thing, I mean, curiosity, I mean, I always thought of Boing Boing as uh, uh, a cabinet of curiosity, you know, the, the predecessor to modern day museums where I would put unusual things that I found interesting in this place to be able to share them with other people. And, and for me, that's always been what, what Boing Boing is about. The only filter I have is if something's interesting to me or not. And I think that that's, um, again, there's nothing wrong, of course, with ha I think of having an audience in mind and writing for that audience and this kind of thing, but 
fortunate, and I, and I do that in other parts of my life, but fortunately I don't have to do that on Boing Boing. And I think that that's surprising because sometimes I'll get an email from someone or something, it, it maybe a PR person, maybe just someone else, and that you should really be writing about this. Why aren't you? This is so Boing Boing. Um, this is a big story. You should be covering this story. And, and by saying, yeah, but it's just, you know, it's cool and all, it's just, no, I'm not interested in that. And that's surprising to people that because you would think that we should be thinking about, you know, what we should be doing. And I don't like any shoulds around, around something that I still like to think of as, as a hobby. The it's also powerfully mnemonic. When you, when you write something up, to express it to a notional stranger like you. You know, if, if someone like me, if I wanted to explain to someone like me why I found this interesting, why it snagged my attention, what would I say about it? When you do that, it helps you remember it. And for me, I end up with this kind of, uh, you know, super saturated solution of fragmentary ideas kind of floating around in my subconscious, waiting to bodge together and nucleate and turn into a book or a story or a speech or an essay or something else. And so it's kind of the first draft or the, the, the raw material of, of everything else. It's like it's always in the back of your mind when you're going around and living your life and exploring new things now. In the back of my mind, it's anytime somebody tells me about something cool or I encounter something cool or interesting or outrageous, uh, a, a little switch flicks. And it's like, well, that oh, that's a Boing Boing poster. That's a video. But this brings us to the troubling issue also of, of community and yeah. commenters. And by my count, and I may be short, I think Boing Boing is on its third comment system, maybe more. Fourth? At least. And no. there was, is it maybe, because there's... Quick topic, discuss, movable type comments, type. blogger comments, WordPress comments, oh and discourse. Now discourse. Yeah, and so, yeah. so you guys inspire a lot of reaction because you write from the heart, you write about things that are interesting, you write about Bigfoot, you write about crypto science, and, and now with... Uh, you know, God help us, we write about Apple. You write about Apple. Yeah. <laughs> Or Android, for that, but open source, Androids? copyright, yeah, I write all, about it. all of these subjects, and some of it is very personal people, some of it is you're challenging their beliefs, religious, whatever. Commenting, you know, you've, sometimes there's been no comments in Boing, but you've had to turn it off. How have you worked through this, where you've got that give and take? You have a community that wants to participate, but there's some people who want to participate a little too hard. What's the balance there, and how have you sought to, to find that? I think, I mean, for me, I always used to say, or I still say, that, that um, for me, you know, I was really inspired by Tim Leary's quote that someone asked him, you know, what, what do you do after you turn on? And he said, you find the others. And for me, that's what Boing Boing, the print zine, and, and meeting Mark and stuff, and, and even events like this is really all about, connected with like-minded people. But then I realized, I think, that a lot of times, um, a lot of people, who, who tend to comment aren't there to connect or even intelligently debate, frankly, or, or have a discussion around something. It's almost like going into it with a negative, from a negative frame of mind. And I think that that can be, that can be hard. And I, and I think that that sometimes, you know, um, spoils the experience of commenting in a comment system, but yet you're expected to have a comment system. But on the other hand, I think comments started almost because, and you were expected to have them, but, but now conversations happen so many other places that maybe it's not as essential that, you know, you better offer this sort of two-way channel right there. So there was a period where we didn't have any comments at all. And what was interesting is that there was no obvious uh, explicit way by which you could send feedback or corrections or whatever on a post or, or additions. And yet, a number of people would figure it out and almost always those additions were useful and valuable and would end up getting reintegrated into the post. And then one day we said like, you know, the, 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 we could very easily add a form to the bottom of every post that said, send us feedback, public, you know, private feedback on the post. Just, just let us know what you thought about it as a way of making it easier to, to do this. That was a horrible idea. And, I think and it was mine. Literally, <laughs> literally, like, uh, uh, the amount of good stuff that we got increased by 0%, and the amount of unusable vitriol increased by 10 trillion percent. Um, and what's, what's kind of interesting is that I think that there's an assumption that if, that, uh, if you have to um, kind of poke around to figure out how to comment, that the people who will give up most easily are the people with something productive to contribute. And what I've actually found experimentally is that the reverse is true. There may be some people with productive things to contribute who are 
uh, for whom a, a, a hoop to go through is a hoop too far, but in fact that there's, there's an enormous number of people for whom a very easy way to contribute uh, allows for a certain thoughtless and vitriolic and, and bilious and pointless kind of just, just I, uh, there is a person on the other end of this forum and I can make them feel bad. I, I, let's see how I can do that. The problem isn't the community, it's the architecture of those systems. Or maybe it's both. Well, then, you know, famously, <laughs> Boing Boing supports disembowelment, which is a great, I don't want to do that anymore. Anymore. Is that gone? It's gone yeah. with the new gone. system. That's interesting, because yeah. for a long time, that was a tool to sort of chide people, right? So Our it was, former what, moderator uh, uh, used that. And now, I mean, I, you know, if, if somebody's a real jerk, I, not, not if they disagree, if they disagree, I don't care, but now our you know, moderators, if somebody's a real jerk, you just delete it. Just ban them. Well, we're almost out of time, so I wanna ask you, of course, prognosticators, futurists, professional futurists in the middle here, <laughs> of the future, what's the future of, a loaded question, what's the future of Boing Boing? You did your first conference, which may surprise people. It's the first time Boing Boing's done its own event. Between that and the entire world that's opened up to us. What's gonna come next? So, so for me, I think one, one of the things that I, I really miss about the zine was that I had a lot of original feature articles and interviews, and we still do that on Boing Boing, but I'd like to do more of it, and I would like to highlight it so that it is available and doesn't just get pushed down the blog river in 20 minutes and become invisible. You know, you can put a ton of time and money into producing a, a good, feature story, and if it just has the same amount of, of uh, uh, if it looks just the same as a blog post of a, of a monkey riding on a, on a goat, an animated GIF file, they're, they're going to get the same amount of hits, and the monkey might actually get more traffic. And so there, there's got to be a better way to do it, to highlight it, and do kind of like, you know, old school magazine design where you feature some things more prominently than others. And, we're working on a redesign um, that will enable us to um, continue with the things that we do really well, which is the existing Boing Boing Blog River, and also be able to um, highlight a lot of the really amazing features, including ones from you yeah. um, and ones from other people here. And they, pay people, too, which is important. That, yeah, that and, people and, have been talking and highlight, about all day here. highlight that works. So I think it, it involves bringing a lot of the DNA of the zine really back into the back into the site. And more podcasts and events and videos too, which are very fun. And yeah. stuff. And we're, we're really, yeah. I want to do, I want to do, yeah. very I, I want to do atoms. I want to do physical objects. Yeah. This is, this is my long-term project is, is, is regular bursts of physical objects that, that you can buy and own. Are you saying that Boing Boing could arrive in my mailbox? <laughs> not, no, 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 not, not a magazine. Tra transporter. But, but, but Maybe a maybe magazine. Like 3D printer. But the kind of things my office is full of. But not you know, the magazine. Weird random junk. <laughs> Let me leave you with Curiosity. A Unicorn Chaser by Rob Biscitza, managing editor Rob Biscitza. Thank you guys all so One of his much. Prettiest. Really thank honor. you, please. Thank you to Glenn. Sh I thank you, Dave. Say, Shenny, Corey, David, and Mark, the anarchy that works. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs>